If we do not know each other, my name is Derek Weidman, along with my beautiful bride. We have the privilege and honor of being the campus pastors at the Lancaster County campus. And uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, in worship. Everyone online, we want to say welcome to you as well. Before we go any further, I want to honor my parents. Uh, they are in the back. So some love to my parents. Trust me, I would not be here today if it wasn't for them in many reasons, um, more reasons than just one, but uh, I'm so thankful to have them here. If you're with us for the very first time, we want to say welcome. Uh, if you're streaming online, we want to say welcome. Can we show some love to any of our first-time visitors that are here in the house? Man, we've been praying for you all week. Uh, it is our prayer that you would experience the freedom of life that only God has to offer here today. And uh, if you're new to our church, um, we are a church that's all about loving God, loving people, and loving life. And we're going to jump into the word together here today. So get your Bibles, get something to take some notes. And, and I'm going to warn you up front, uh, I feel like preaching here today. Uh, I really do. Uh, you can clap for that. It's all good. Uh, I feel like preaching here today. Uh, I've spent the last two and a half weeks in California. Um, don't judge. Uh, but I've been in California visiting my wife's family, and so I feel refreshed. I feel energized today. Uh, I'm running on caffeine and the Holy Ghost. Um, it was a long travel day yesterday, but I am here. I am. I'm psyched. I'm ready. Uh, so if I get a little passionate today, just know it's all about Jesus. Uh, I love Jesus and his word. I'm very passionate about that. Anybody else in here today love Jesus and his word? Come on. I do pray that this word will bless you. If you can turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 4, we're going to start in verse 7. Uh, this is our last week of our series called Different. I don't know about you, but I've really... Uh, enjoyed this series. This series has blessed me and challenged me all at the same time. Uh, each week I've walked away from the message being like, man, that was so good. But then I was, I was also like, man, I really need to do, do some things differently. Uh, and, and I'm just excited because, uh, you know, I, I just believe that in this day and hour, I believe that God is calling his church uh, to stand up, to rise up and, and stand out uh, in our day. In a world, if, if the world ever needed the church to shine bright, it is right now, amen? And uh, we are not called to be the same. We are called to, to something different, something that is eternal. And I pray that today that we can leave this place encouraged and strengthened in Jesus' name, amen? amen? So let's get to our text here today. Today I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. So if you don't, if you don't have that version or you don't have a Bible, we will have the verses on the screen. So 1 Peter chapter 4, starting in verse 7. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, come on, say therefore. therefore. Come on, I, I, need, I need some feedback here today. It's the second service, so you slept in, you got some extra coffee. Uh, the, the, the louder you are, uh, the more feedback you give me, the faster I'll preach, and we can get out, get out of here and get some food, amen? Come on, there we go. So therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded. Don't hold me to that, by the way. Uh, sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, come on, say above all. Above all, above all keep lo loving one another earnestly. Now take note of this phrase here. Since love covers a multitude of sins, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. As good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. I don't know about you, but man, I just love God's word. It is so rich. It is so true. Uh, today, if I could title my message anything, it would be different in urgency. Different in urgency. Over the next few moments that we have together here today, I'm going to preach from this big idea. Urgency produces productivity. Urgency produces productivity. Come on, let's go before the Lord in prayer. Uh, if you feel comfortable, uh, go ahead and stretch your hands toward heaven as an act of surrender. Father, we thank you for your holy presence. 
that is in this place right now. God, we can feel your spirit around us. And so, Father, right now we want to thank you for gracing us with your presence. Father, we, we, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the life-changing principles that we can find in your word. And so right now, as we go to your word, Father, we ask that, God, that you would speak to our hearts, God, that you would challenge us, that you would strengthen us, that we can leave this place and never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, on my time uh, of vacation, I came, I came across a very interesting article that WeatherWise put out. And in the article, they talked about a not-so-new phenomenon called hurricane fatigue. Hurricane fatigue quite naturally happens to people who are living in the areas of our nation, um, particularly prone to hurricanes. So people who live in the Florida panhandle, those who live on the eastern shores of our nation, these are people who are most commonly given to the concept of hurricane fatigue. Hurricane fatigue happens in these regions because due to the rapid increase of weather forecasters predicting that hurricanes are on the horizon, there are people who lack a sense of urgency. Come on, there's our key word here today. Come on, say urgency. Those who have hurricane fatigue lack a sense of urgency. These people, for whatever reason, have made up in their minds that they are not going to take the, the, the pending forecast seriously. That no matter what is said, no matter what is predicted, they are going to live their life any kind of way. So while everybody else is boarding up their windows and getting out of Dodge, they're going to continue sitting on their porch enjoying life as normal. Because after all, the last report that the weatherman gave, the, the hurricane didn't even come. It, or, or maybe it changed directions, or, or maybe it came and it wasn't as bad. <clears throat> Excuse me, it wasn't as bad as they said it would be. These are people who have hurricane fatigue. In fact, there's a famous photo of a woman who after, after Hurricane Ike was forecasted, she held up a sign at a ball game that said, Take a hike, Ike. She wasn't going to leave. She was going to live her life the way she wanted to live it. She wasn't going to change anything. And the great tragedy of hurricane fatigue is that when the hurricane does hit, when the storm does come, and it comes with the full weight of the force that was forecasted, many people are injured. Many people are harmed and Tragically, some even lose their lives, all because they did not take the report seriously. They did not have a sense of urgency. Come on, say urgency. urgency. Now stay with me now. Because they did not have a sense of urgency, they did not change the course of their actions. And as I was reading this article on hurricane fatigue, the Holy Spirit began to speak, on me, speak to me about a, a spiritual phenomenon. And in the same sense, it's nothing new, but it's just as dangerous. And it's called what I like to call it uh, second coming fatigue. If you, if you just read your Bible through Genesis to Revelation, there is a message that keeps presenting itself in almost every single book. Prophecies are made about Jesus Christ in the Old Testament and, and you read them all through the prophets and there, some are explicit in detail and others are implying it. They're declaring in one way or another, he is coming, he is coming, he is coming. And then we get over to the New Testament where Jesus Christ said it himself, he was going to return. He said, I, I will return in the clouds, saying that you and I, we need to be watchful. Don't get caught slipping. Don't get caught sleeping because Jesus said, I am coming. I am coming. I am returning unto you. The, apostle, the apostles continue to talk about it through their writings in the remaining of the New Testament. They served in a lot of ways as spiritual forecasters, letting us know of the hurricane, of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, this is so important. There's an entire book of the Bible that is dedicated to the one central message. He is coming, he is coming, he is coming. And all the while in the day and age that we are living in today, 
There are too many of us who are suffering from second coming fatigue where we adhere to the truth that Jesus is coming back one day, meaning we accept it as a fact or, or, or essential to our faith in God, yet we find ourselves embedded in spiritual apathy and complacency. We find ourselves in apathy and complacency in the way in which we live for him where we know it in our heads, but it is not impact, it has not impacted our hands and our feet. We believe in our hearts that Jesus is returning, yet we live our lives with no urgency, with the guarding of our hearts, meaning we live however we want. We say whatever we want. We watch whatever we want. We listen to whatever we want. We behave however we want to behave. And when that happens, we come to a place of spiritual death. And you need to hear me. When you come to that place and you are spiritually dead, that is when you and I are led by our head. But God has sent me here today day to stand on this very platform to awaken his people out of complacency, to awaken his people out of apathy, to awaken his people to live a life of holiness. For God said, be holy, for I am holy. And I believe with all of my heart here today that God is calling his people to awaken, to live differently, to believe differently, to act differently, to love differently. Come on, I'm here today to declare with boldness and all seriousness, wake up church for our God will return. He is coming. He is coming. John, he said, Jesus said in John chapter 14, for in my father's house, there are many mansions for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will return again to you. Jesus said, I will return unto you to, so that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus is coming again and he is looking for his spotless church, his church to be different than the world that we live in. There needs to be a sense of urgency in our hearts that will affect the way that we walk out this life for urgency produces productivity church I'm going to say it again he is coming he is coming he is coming and that needs to push us for to live our lives differently to impact the world around us second coming fatigue this is important to understand because when we come to our text here Peter begins with the note of urgency. He continues this constant theme by saying the end of all things is at hand. It's at hand. It's at hand. Peter is making a reference to the second coming of Jesus Christ. It's as if he is continuing the legacy of the previous spiritual weatherman by saying he is coming. The end of all things is at hand. Now, remember, Peter is writing the church He's writing to those who have followed Jesus. And now on the heels of the statement and after he says, sets up this sense of urgency, Peter begins to give us a list of things to do. A list of things to do as we prepare for Jesus to come again. Peter says, because he is coming, be self-controlled. Because he is coming, be sober-minded. Because he is coming, love one another. Because he is coming, show hospitality. Because he is coming, use your gifts that God has given you to build up his church. Hear it now. In, in the Bible, prophecy is never given to us to, for us to merely speculate and wait in apathy. That's not the point of prophecy. In the Bible, we are never called to simply twiddle our thumbs and sit back and, and wait for his coming. Peter says, man... Because he is coming, have a sense of urgency. Give your life to something that matters. Stop wasting and, and giving your time away. Get after the kingdom of God. Sign up for growth track and be a part of the dream team. Start hosting a small group and begin to watch God use your life and impact his kingdom. Verse 7 Peter says that the end of all things is at hand. But Jesus didn't return in Peter's day. He didn't even return in the next year. In fact, we're still waiting for him to return. So what does it mean when Peter says the end of all things is at hand? Well, it means that in God's redemptive plan, there's only one thing left to happen. In other words, man sins in the garden. 
That sin separates man from God. So then God acts by sending his one and only son to, to live a life that we could not live, to die a death that we should have died. He was crucified. They placed him in the tomb. Then on the third day, he resurrects from the dead and steps out of that grave, just as it was written in early scriptures. Then in Acts chapter 1, we see where he ascends to heaven to be seated next to his father. Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit is released to give uh, power to his people to live boldly for him on this earth. And now there's just one thing left, his return. And just as he came once, fulfilling over 300 Old Testament prophecies, I want to let you know here today that the great I am, the one true Messiah, Jesus, the son of the living God, will surely return for his church. Therefore, get busy. Therefore, don't waste away your life watching the latest uh, Netflix series, just binging it all day long. Therefore, love. Therefore, show hospitality to one another. Therefore, live every day like it's your last. Jesus has called us to go into the world and make disciples. Jesus has empowered us through the Holy Spirit to be his witnesses. So therefore, let's get busy. In the book of The Rise of Christianity, Rodney Stark says that in the end of the first century, conservatively speaking, there was around one to 2,000 Christ followers. But by the end of the fourth century, that number jumped to 7.5 million people following Jesus. When I read that, I, I, that, I asked myself, why was the church so busy during that time frame, here's the answer. Paul writes in Philippians, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Here it is, that the Lord is at hand. The apostle James writes, you also be patient, establish your hearts. Here it is again, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. First John, children, it is the last hour. You have heard that the Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. Revelation 22 declares, he who testifies to these things, speaking of Jesus, surely I am coming soon. How does that number jump from a thousand, a couple thousand people to 7.5 million people following Christ? Was there was a group of people who knew that God had called them to live differently? There was a group of people who made up the, in their minds that no matter what happened to them, that no matter what was said about them, no matter what trouble they faced, this group of people understood that Jesus was surely coming back. One day they knew, swing low, sweet chariot, coming forth to carry me home church at any single moment of the day he can appear and call us home to him so therefore we as a church we're going to stay busy the enemy thought that through COVID this church was going to stop that the church as a whole was going to quit but I declare in this time and in this hour there are still some people with a different kind of urgency in their spirits we're going to get busy about what Jesus is about and that is seeking and saving the lost and if you're watching the stream here today. I want to let you know that no matter where you find yourself, God loves you. He has a plan for your life. Come on. Your God loves you today. Come on, church. Let's get excited about the things of the Lord again. Hearts are going to be returning home to the Lord. Marriages are going to be restored in Jesus' name. Young people are going to be filled with purpose and vision. And I see a church. Come on. I see a church who is standing firm on the word of God, not being tossed around by the clever words of man but standing on the truth of God's word for it is the truth of God's word that will set people free come on if you're one of those people who are going to stand firm on the word of God come on take five seconds right now where you find yourself and give God some praise come on let every devil know in hell that I am not standing on what the world what the world says I'm standing on God's word for his truth will set people free now we got to get to our text our text is a clarion call for the church to wake up this whole passage of scripture can be summed up in three words and it's our big idea 
urgency. Urgency produces productivity. Because I understand he's coming, I'm now urgent. Because I understand that he is coming, I'm now intentional with the time that I've been given because I understand that my time can be shorter than I expect. Urgency produces productivity. Peter is saying to us today that there needs to be a sense of urgency in our lives and that we're living in a time where Jesus can return at any moment. And that must cause us to live differently and be about the right things. So what are these things that you and I are to be about? What are those things that Peter is calling us to be about? Verse 7, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, because he is coming, have a sense of urgency, no second coming fatigue. Therefore, here's what you and I need to be about. Peter says, be self-controlled and sober-minded. Peter begins by saying, if you and I are going to be different, if you and I are going to be about What Jesus is about in these last days, write this down, we need to have a clear perspective. The idea of self-control and being sober-minded is really quite straightforward. It was used and defined the same way in their culture as we do today. Meaning it it was of a person who had too much alcohol. In the culture of their time, Many would drink wine. It was a part of their custom to have wine with their meal. And and a person who was sober-minded was a person who knew when to say when. They could enjoy without being inebriated. And, And hear what Peter is saying in the supernatural to us today. He's saying, listen, we live in a great time period. We live in a great area. I know a lot of people like to throw shade on our area and, 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 and the weather and all of these different things, but we live in a great area. We can go to the beach. We can go to the mountains in, in, in a short drive. We can, uh, you know, we have beautiful farmland with great scenery and, and all of those things. We're surrounded by culture with great shops and great food. There you were wondering when I was going to talk about food in my message. Those of you who like to golf, God bless you. We got some great golf courses around. We have hiking trails. We got great lakes and fishing and great hunting. Peter is saying enjoy all of that, but don't get drunk. Don't get inebriated with the trinkets of this life. Enjoy this life. Go on vacationing without vacationing from God. Go hunting and fishing, go golfing, go travel around this great area. But Peter is saying to us today, if we're going to be different, if we're going to be about what Jesus is about, then we are going to have to have a clear perspective, understanding that the punchline of this life is not pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. Oh, and by the way, just so I can feel better about myself, let me just sprinkle a little bit of Jesus over here and and over everything so I can feel better about myself. No. Peter says, be sober-minded, be self-controlled. It's this idea of being disciplined. I know that's not a very popular word to use these days, but we're called to be different, people who are disciplined and people who have a clear perspective and, and one who's able to navigate through this life, understanding that ultimately this life is not about us, it's not about me, 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 and understanding that we are just passing through We can enjoy without getting drunk on the things of this world and exercising self-control. We need to have a clear perspective of this life, not allowing the pace of this world to, to dictate how we live. All Peter is saying here is that we are in this great mall of this world and there is wonderful things that we can enjoy. We can walk down this aisle and and we can walk down that aisle and, and, and we can responsibly enjoy what God has blessed us with. But don't forget that this world is not your final zip code. Remember 1 Peter chapter 2, for you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and you and I, we have been called to be different. 
We need to have a clear perspective on everything that God has called us to. So that requires us to be in the word of God. That requires us to have an understanding of what God is saying in this time and in this day. To know what he says for ourselves. Come on, if you're ready to have a clear perspective, if you're ready to push aside all the cares of this world and focus on Jesus, yes, we can enjoy this world. Yes, we can enjoy our lives. But our ultimate focus is giving God glory, giving God honor with our lives and reaching the lost, reaching the people who matter. Come on, let's celebrate Jesus and what and be about what Jesus is about. Urgency produces productivity, and that productivity means that we should have a clear perspective. Secondly, write this down in your notes. We should have a covering love. A covering love. I love what it says in verse 8. Peter says, above all, above all, above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Wow. That's rich. Scholars agree that love is the New Testament cardinal virtue. Jesus said it himself in John chapter 13. Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you. By this, come on, say by this. By this, this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. Not by what church you go to. Not by how many books you read. Not by how many scriptures you have memorized. Not by how many arguments you can have with people on social media. Not by how many heretics you can expose and shame. Come on, somebody. Yeah, I just said that. No, Jesus said by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another in a world that loves the shame, in a world that loves the cancel, in a world that loves to dishonor others. It is time for the body of Christ to rise up and be different. It is time for the church to have a covering love, to love one another, love those who are different than you, love those who look different, who act different, who vote different, who live out the word love different. Come on. And I just got to say, Say this right now. Love is not love. Love is defined by the Bible for what is love. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It does not dishonor others. Come on. Love is not self-seeking. It does. It keeps no records of wrong. And God is calling us today to put on love because love binds us in perfect unity. Come on. If you're ready to put aside differences and put on love, then give God some praise come on right now he is worthy of our praise the bible says first corinthians 13 the greatest of these is love galatians lists the fruit of the spirit but listen to the order it starts by the fruit of the spirit is love love the lead off to everything is love and now peter in our text is saying above all love Love one another. Why? Since love covers a multitude of sins. Now let me work this a little bit. Peter here is writing the church. He's writing to Christ's followers, and he's using the word love relationally. And he uses it in the context of other believers sinning. And Peter is saying, if you and I, if we're going to deal with people, we need to have love in our hearts. Because each of us are going to sin, whether it's sinning against one another or just falling short and sin. We all are going to sin. So when people don't act right, when people let us down, we need to have the weapon of love. And Peter says two things about love in this verse. He calls us to love earnestly, and he says that love covers a multitude of sins. Now, in this text, the original word for earnestly here, Strong defines that word. He defines it as to stretch. It's literally like a picture of two people who are holding a blanket, and they're pulling against one another, and that blanket is covering a person. And they keep pulling and keep pulling and keep pulling. Love, the Bible says here, it stretches and it covers. Peter is saying, is he saying that we should hide people's sins or or cover them up? Stay with me now. 
every New Testament point has an Old Testament picture. Let me say that again. Every New Testament point has an Old Testament picture. In Genesis chapter 9, we read a story of a man named Noah. I'm not going to read it for the sake of time, but I want to reference it because I encourage you to study it for yourself. But here's the overview. Noah sins, and the Bible says that he did not just drink. Noah got drunk, and in his sin, there was shame. He was naked. Watch it now, Ham sees his father's sin, and instead of covering it, instead of dealing with it, he begins to talk, he begins to gossip. While, while, while his brothers see the sin, they deal, his other brothers, they see the sin, and they decide to deal with it. The, the Bible says, here it is, the Bible says that they took a garment, and they stretched that blanket they stretched that garment and they walked backwards and they covered their father's shame. This is what love does. So both of these scriptures give us a picture of love covering sin. Watch it now. To cover sin does not mean to hide it. It doesn't mean to ignore it or, or, or sweep it under the rug. To cover sin means I deal with it. And I deal with it in such a way that the, the, uh, as best as I can, I preserve, here it is, the person's dignity in the process. Did you get what I just said? You see, the problem with today's culture is we want to expose everybody. We want to shame everybody. And we have too many hams and not enough shems and japhets. And this can be so damning uh, to our culture. And, and the most damning thing that we can do is this. Because watch what happens in Genesis. Look who gets cursed and who God deals with. It's not Noah who got drunk. It was the one who didn't cover it. And today, God is challenging us as his church body to be people who have the right perspective, who have hearts of love, who deal with issues in a way that doesn't shame. Why? Because Christ did not shame us. God sees our sin. He, God sees our mistakes. He sees our shortcomings. And God, in his grace and his mercy and his love, he's not overlooking our sin. He's not dismissing our sin. But in his love for us, he is covering us and giving us the opportunity to deal with our sin. Come on, church. It is time. Uh, in, in this day, in this hour, it is time for us to have a different perspective, to have a different love. Let's rise up in a covering love for one another and for this world. Come on. Come on. If you're with me today, right now, just stretch your hands toward heaven and ask God to fill you with his love. Come on. That love that never gives up. That love that never shames. That love that always forgives. For Jesus first loved us. So let's go from this place with a heart of love for his church and for this world. God, fill us with your love. The Bible says that love covers a multitude, multitude of sins and mistakes. Who have you covered? Who have you covered? Listen, I made some really dumb mistakes in my life, even after following Jesus. And I stand before you here today because there were people in my life who covered me and did not shame me. Who have you covered? Urgency produces productivity. Because he's coming back, have a clear perspective. Because he's coming back, have a covering love. Write this down, a hospitable spirit. Verse 9, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Strong's breaks down the Greek word for hospitality this way. The prefix means friend, and the root word means stranger. So here Peter is literally calling us to befriend the stranger. In a world that seemingly wants to isolate more and more, in a world that says it's, it's just me, myself, and I, in a world that says it's just me and my close group, God is saying, no, I've called you to be different. And Peter here is saying, the end of all things is here, and Jesus is coming back, and Jesus gave us clear instructions to take this message of hope to the world around us so we don't have time to sit around in our own little world to be so self-absorbed.
Five times in the New Testament, the word hospitality is used. Here's, here's a few of them. Hebrews 13, 5, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. Romans 12, 13, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. So the, the, the idea of hospitality and showing hospitality, the idea of friending strangers is not opening up your home for your boys. Hospitality is not just chilling and kicking back with the people that you are in long-term relationship with. Hospitality literally means opening up your home to the people you don't even know. Your neighbors, co-workers, people who have fallen on hard times. In fact, this is so important to God that one of the qualifications for being an elder in the church as outlined in 1 Timothy in the book of Titus is the ability to show hospitality. This may not be the deepest point that you'll ever hear me preach, but I cannot stress to you enough of how important this is. The New Testament church started with hospitality. You wonder why we do small groups here at Freedom Life. It's because urgency produces productivity and because we love each other earnestly and because we understand that our time here on earth is limited so we are, we are going to show hospitality to one another without grumbling. There are people in your world who will never step foot in church, but they will come to the sanctuary of your home. Your dinner table could be the, the first pulpit they ever experience. I think I'm saying her first name right. Rosaria Butterfield shares her own personal testimony in her book, The Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert. She holds a PhD and she was teaching in, a, in the feminist department at the, Syri uh, the University of Syracuse and she was living an openly gay lifestyle. She had a partner for many years and she talks about in her book, she writes this bashing article back in the 90s against this uh, men's movement called the Promise Keepers. This men's ministry had reached an all-time high. I mean, they were reaching thousands of men for Christ. And so then all of a sudden she gets this letter sent to her in response to the article that she wrote. And this letter was from a local pastor and she was expecting judgment. She was expecting condemnation and that's not what she got from this pastor. Instead, she got an invitation to the pastor's home an invitation for her and her lesbian partner for dinner. She goes over to the pastor's house with her girlfriend and they sit down at the dinner table and again, she's expecting that this pastor is going to begin to, uh, you know, just bash her and scold them and con, you know, just, just be so harsh with them. But the pastor didn't point out all the scriptures that would go against their lifestyle. He didn't scold them. He didn't condemn them. The pastor just began to love on them. And that dinner turned into another dinner, turned into another dinner, and two years later, another dinner. Never stepping foot inside the, this pastor's church, but two years later after relationship and friendship, two years of hospitality to someone who was completely different in lifestyle, Rosaria says that after two years of all of this, her and her girlfriend repented of their lifestyle and surrendered their hearts and their lives to Christ. And now she continues to write, but she's not, she's not writing those kind of articles. Now she is writing, helping others to deal with that lifestyle. And she travels around and speaking and giving lectures on this. And she says what opened the door for Christ to come into her heart and change her life was hospitality. The key to hospitality is to begin. It doesn't matter if you live in an apartment, a dorm, or a house. Just open up your home. Bake some cookies. Say hello to people. Let's be the hands and feet of Jesus. Urgency produces productivity. Have a clear perspective. Have a covering love. Show hospitality. Last, lastly, write this down. Have a servant's heart. Be given to Christian service. 
Peter says in verse 10, each has received a gift. Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. In a world that's all about being served, what can you do for me in a world that is racked with entitlement? God has called his church to be different. And here Peter is like, God has given you each a gift. If you are a Christ follower here today, when you got saved, you didn't only get the gift of salvation. You did not only receive Jesus, but you also received a spiritual gift. If you want to know more about spiritual gifts, go back and listen to our Divine Flow series. You can also read about them. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, 14, Romans chapter 12, and then our text here today. It really is an incredible statement of love. That God loves us so much that when we place our faith in Him, He doesn't only redeem our souls, He also gives us a gift. And our text says that the gift that God gives us is a gift of grace. Meaning we receive these gifts not because of anything that we can do. We receive these gifts because of God's grace. Therefore, if we receive them by grace, we need to use them humbly. And we need to use them to serve the body of Christ. I'm going to wrap this up because I'm just going to be coughing. I can feel it. Let me just say this, and then we'll wrap it up. If you're not actively using your gift to build up his church. <sighs> Help me, Jesus. If you're not actively using the gift that God has given you to build up his church, then in some way, shape, or form, you are slowing down God's building project that is called the church. If all church is, is, is for you to say, preacher, give me a word, give me a word, feed me faster, feed me, give me, give me, give me, you're headed to spiritual obesity. God has given us gifts. And a healthy, spiritual, mature believer moves from being a consumer to a contributor. We don't own this gift. It's been given to us. It's been entrusted to us. One day we're going to stand before God and give an account to how we use that gift to build his church. God has called his people to stand out. We are called to be different in difficulties. We will demonstrate our faith. We will draw closer to God and not let our difficulties drive us away from God. We've been called to be different in direction in a world that is anti-Christ. We as the body of Christ will, will follow him and his word. And following Christ and his word will always take us in a different direction than the world. What direction are you going in? What direction are your kids headed in? Do our lives line up with the world or God's word? We are also called to be different in our dedication. I know it may get tough to follow Jesus in this day, but do not be afraid. We have an eternal perspective. Why? Because we are different in our urgency. In any given moment, Christ can return. This afternoon isn't promised. Tomorrow isn't promised. Have a sense of urgency. Live your life for what matters most. And I feel as though there are those in the house or watching online. God has orchestrated this moment in time for you to hear this message because you have allowed yourself to slip into second coming fatigue. You have zero sense of urgency. You have found yourself complacent where you're not living, you're not, you're not loving the world around you as God has called you to love. You have isolated yourself where it's all about you and God has sent me here today to let you know, have a sense of urgency and allow that urgency to push you out 
out of these four walls and into the world around us. Have a covering love. Open your home to those who are different than you and begin to use the gifts that God has entrusted to get and gave you to build up his church. Come on, somebody. If you're ready to be different, if you're ready to stand out, then stand up on your feet right now and say, I'm standing on God's word. I'm going to use my life to bring him glory, to bring him honor. Come on, lift up a shout of praise. Give God your best praise in this place. Come on, we're called to be different. We're going to live our lives different. So the question then becomes, if you knew for a fact that Jesus was returning in 24 hours, what would you stop doing? Then stop it. If you knew Jesus was coming for sure in 24 hours, what would you start doing? start doing it he's coming he's coming I want to give you an opportunity to respond I have a call to two different people first person you're here and you hear me say he is coming he is coming and you know in your heart that if he would come he wouldn't come for you I want to let you know that all that can change in this moment right now the Bible says that all we have to do is confess out of our mouth that he is Lord, confess our sins to Jesus. The Bible says that he is faithful and he is just to forgive us. I want to invite you to do that right now. The second person, you're here and you're suffering from second coming fatigue. You're living every day for yourself with no regard and no urgency that Christ could return in any moment. Now, again, I'm not saying we can't enjoy life. But don't, you've been getting drunk on life. You've been filling your calendar. You've been filling up your time with everything that is about you and, and nothing that will continue to live on after you're gone. And God is saying, wake up. I've put you on this earth in this time right now for a purpose. I've given you gifts. I've, I've given you my spirit. I've given you everything that you need in this life to succeed and to, and to fulfill your plan, the, the plan and the purpose that he has for your life. So stop sitting back and wasting away. He's called us to be different. He's called us to love he's called us to be hospitable to those who are different he's called us to use the gifts that he's given us to build his church some of you you're not serving anymore simply because you're comfortable you're happy watching online or you're happy just coming in and being able to leave. Stop wasting the gift that God has given you and start building his church. This isn't condemnation. This is a wake-up call. God loves you. And he's looking to use you. So if that's where you find yourself with every head bowed and every eye closed, just go ahead and raise your hand. Either you're coming back to God accepting him into your life or you're saying, you know what? I'm stepping out and I'm going to use my life for God's glory. If you raise your hand or not, I want to lead us through a prayer. Everyone out of your mouth, watching online and in the house, say, Dear Heavenly Father, come on, everyone out of your mouth, Dear Heavenly Father, I come before you a sinner in need of a Savior. I believe that your son Jesus came to the earth, lived a sinless life, went to the cross, went to the grave, and then rose again. Right now, through your Holy Spirit, come into my heart, forgive me my sins, wash me, and make me new. Right now, I declare that I'm a child of God. 
And right now, I declare that I'm going to live for you. I'm going to use the gift that you have given me to build your church. So, Lord, I thank you for your love. I thank you for the gift that you have given me. In Jesus' name. Come on, in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen. Come on, let's lift up a shout of praise. Come on, let's lift up a shout of praise. You received that word here today. Hey, thanks for tuning in to our online experience. It's our prayer that you experience the freedom and life that only God has to offer. If you have a prayer request or a question, go ahead and drop us a line. Email us at hope at freedom.life. And if this message blessed you, share it on social media, send it to a friend, be a hope dealer. And again, thanks for tuning in. And we believe in your life, the best is still yet to come.